right, the Noam Chomsky argument of it isn't really a choice to work uh, for some guy with all this economic power. I mean, it's it's if I don't work for him, I starve to death. That's not really a choice. That's like if I don't pay taxes, I go to jail. So how's that any different? Um, it's it's a false choice, of course. So I'm going to work for him because either I starve to death if I don't. Well, I like you know being consistent and taking pushing things as far as they can go to its to to expose the absurdity of this position. So if we're going to say that um, there's no physical aggression here, right? No one's saying I'll hurt you if you don't work for me, and if they do, that's wrong, and neither one of us is defending that. But if we're saying that it's exploitation to uh, – that capitalism is exploitation because a person – the only reason a person is working for someone is because otherwise they'll starve to death. Well, we can't have any transactions. The only reason I'm even buying food in the supermarket is because my body needs to eat. I'd rather buy that. I'd rather spend that money on hookers, but I need my body says I have to eat. Am I being exploited by the supermarket? Uh, I, I have to buy a car. I, I want to visit people, and they live thousand miles away, and the and cars are expensive. The only reason I'm spending all this money to buy a car is uh is because uh I can't just fly and 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 visit people like that. So I don't really want to spend thousands of dollars to buy a car. I'm being exploited by the car structural companies. violence. Structural I'm violence. Being, I'm being exploited by the car companies because I'm I I wouldn't if if I had other options I wouldn't do it. Fine. If you had other options, you wouldn't do it. But you don't necessarily always have other options. And and who's who's really the exploitative one? If someone's let's say getting paid a dollar an hour, which I agree sucks, uh, and he and he has that job. Well, he has that job for a few reasons. Either he can't he can't find anything anyone will pay him more, or. Uh, Perhaps maybe there's maybe the job means something to him, and he he's willing to sacrifice some income to have a meaningful job, right? Well, who's who's the exploitative one in this relationship? The person who who's only going to pay someone a dollar an hour, or everyone else who wouldn't even pay that guy a dollar an hour? This is the guy who's saying, "You think I'm ex you think I'm exploitative by paying him a dollar an hour?" Other people will only pay him 75 cents. Other people will only pay him 50 cents. That's why he's coming to me and not working for them. So who's really the exploitative one? This is the best and, it, and nicest offer he has. And if he doesn't take that, he that's when he really starves, right? I mean, like, there's no other option. People think that like, we have all these other options. We could just end scarcity to tomorrow. It's an unrealistic fantasy right. world that people live in. And this is the thing. People are like, sweatshops are bad. Well, once Compared again... To what? Well, hold on. I think they are bad, and I think they wouldn't exist in a, in a free society as, as we know them today. And it's because government regulations in China, you have the most sweatshops in China, and you also have some of the most communism uh, in, that, in that southeast region area. Okay, I'm not saying that, that you can't have a sweatshop. I'm saying sweatshops exist because all other economic productivity has been limited or destroyed. And that's why they don't have that choice, just like you're saying. Without the ability, the, the government is the one who's killing off this, op, uh, this, this competition. Government's the one who's destroying the economic wealth around us. They're the ones who are limiting other people from competing and, and, and bringing other uh, ideals to the market. They're the ones who are stopping and giving special advantages through regulations to other people. And sweatshops, like, like you don't think that the sweatshops have a connection with the government? Bullshit. They do. A lot of them do. Uh, the, the, they, they might even make them illegal, just like child labor, but kids are working everywhere in China. That's, right. Chinese labor laws don't mean a damn thing. Right. The reason they don't work here is because we have enough prosperity, because we have so much production, because we, for a while there, didn't have so much government intervention. Unfortunately, we're falling back into a second right. world country. And, I'm not sure and, if, and if you have to uh, – let me just go on the topic for child labor laws. Uh, if you have child labor laws, and certainly if you have compulsory education – uh, what you are made, you are first of all, when you have child labor laws, you are telling people, don't have children, don't have children, be because because it will cost you more money, right? A person who has no children, versus a family that has children, and the same amount of people are working, just the parents, because child labor laws are illegal. Now you you have you have made it a disadvantage to have kids, right? You are saying don't have kids and you'll have more money, um, and so. 
you know, if you want less uh, people in the world, if you want a less production because there's less people to produce these things, fine. But also compared to what? You know, people who are working in sweatshops, they're not saying, you know, I just got a job to be a lawyer, but I'd rather work in a sweatshop because I'm weird that way. It's this or prostitution. It's this or starve to death. So are sweatshops bad? Yeah, but compared to what? Compared to what? What, what are the other alternatives? And t taking away the few alternatives people have because it's not ideal isn't compassion. It's completely misguided and, and cruel. And here's another thing. While we're on child labor laws here, for anybody to say, well, you're under 18, you can't work... It's kind of like saying, well, first of all, it just means they're going to do it under the table. Or, like, like people who really need to work are not going to work, right? You're going to find a way to survive whether the state's going to throw you in a goddamn cage or not, right? right. And the thing that really irks me here is that it is really trying to build the dependence up in the state. Don't, don't work. Come to our indoctrination center for 12 years. Sit in our indoctrination classroom for 12 years and listen to our indoctrinated teacher talk, teach you revisionist history from a more relativist status perspective. Mm -hmm. Child labor laws do not allow kids to build up skills freely. So in other words, you have a 15-year-old, he wants to go into the labor market, um, and he's not allowed to, right? Because you, you have to be 16 or up in, in many states to work. So 15 years old, he's got an offer, hey man, when you get off of school, you want to come to, to my place for three hours, and I'll show you how to put cars together. I'll show you how to put lawnmowers together. I'll show you how to uh, uh, day trade or whatever, whatever they, they, they are interested in, right? Uh, well, the, all of these skills and the Apprenticeship, like we were talking about earlier, is just is uh, disincentivized. It's it's not going to be fulfilled because uh, the child labor laws push them or stop them from doing that. Uh, and maybe the kid, he I guess he could go do it for free, and then the, he can get around it that way. And then you just screwed him out of what five dollars an hour or whatever, right? And this a lot of the, and a lot of these people who are against child labor laws support volunteering. So let me get this straight: working for free is not exploitative, but working for five bucks is. Yeah, I, I never said that. So let me get this right. You have a minimum wage law set at $7, but political candidates, they can have these secretaries and their interns and their and the, and the, and the students uh, from other schools who are trying to earn school credit. They just work for free. Wow, wow. That that, that sounds pretty exploitive to me if you're going to talk about anything being exploitive, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, now let's, let's move over to the labor theory of value because sure. – First, I, what I want to state is that we have to look at this. The, what, first of all, what is labor theory of value for those who might not understand? Labor theory of value says, well, everybody should be more equal economically, and we're going to have this central plan system, and what it's going to do is make sure that everybody gets their full amount of labor so that the capitalist business owner doesn't steal it from them, right? All these, once again, vague terms. And so um, what, what they'll do is uh, say, well, we think that building a car – is going to take uh, 100 hours, right? It's going to take 100 labor hours, I'll say. And uh, each of those labor hours comes out to $17 uh, or something like that. Well, the laborer should get all of that money, right? Uh, in many cases, they ignore a lot of other costs that go into the system. Uh, they, they, it's just like labor is the only cost. But I think what's really important to realize here is the subjective theory of value. Right. The subjective theory of value basically states that people perceive things uh, at different values. So in other words, like we were talking about the McDonald's hamburger er earlier, you might really think it's a great deal for a dollar. Dude, I wouldn't even buy that for five bucks, right? This is an analogy, hypothetical. Uh, well, in that case, we have a different preference, right? There's not one set price for everything in our heads. We all value things differently. We all have different uh, preferences and, va and values, uh, especially over other uh, tangible items, right? And I guess you could say intangible too. But my point is that the labor theory of value uh, is completely obliterated by the fact that you don't have a standard objective measure, plus it doesn't even – it's like a time static. So in other words, let's say that the, the, the value is $17 today. Are you going to measure that same value in 100 years? Well, without a, a, a money system, they're saying, well, what we'll do is just give you a fifth of a car or something like that. But then you get back to the economic calculation problem once again. So the labor theory of value, uh, the reason it's, it's uh, bollocks, as George Donnelly likes to say, is that it, it tries to uh, give a subjective uh, – uh, or a, an objective value to something that's really a subjective value. You, you can't objectively take all this information and just have it stack, especially forever. Um, but I guess that's probably the best way I can label it, is that the labor theory of value itself it makes no sense because we value things from a subjective viewpoint. Right. Well, um, I think you explained the subjective uh, theory 
very well. But I, if I can maybe explain the labor theory of value a bit clearer, uh, the labor theory of value basically uh, doesn't just say you should get all the labor. It also says that the more labor something took is worth. So if something took 10 hours to make, that's worth more than something that took five hours to make because less labor was involved, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in grad school. Uh, one, of, one of my teachers, a uh, first day of class, he said, if you study really hard and uh, get a bad grade, don't think if you come to me and get a bad grade saying, I studied hard, it's going to make a difference. The labor theory of studying has as much validity as the labor theory of value. I it was, I no, that I, I, was that's better. a perfect example, and that's the thing. So in, in some cases, uh, th they would say, well, uh, in this case, it's more valuable to just work all the time. We might as well just dig ditches, right? I mean, that's that's some good labor right there. Now, man, that's some great labor. That, that takes a lot to dig ditches and fill them back, uh, back up all day. But you're not creating any real wealth, right? You're not right. making anything more productive. What we want to do is minimize the amount of labor necessary <laughs> right. for, all, for all things. That's what we want to do right. so we can spend more time with our kids and our families and our grandmas and our loved right. ones and our right. girlfriends and wives. That's what we really want, right? We want to right. minimize the labor, whereas they take the labor theory value makes it look like, well, the more work we do, the better, you know? I mean, that, that's right. really the way it's perceived in the end. Right. And also, I mean, for anyone who believes in the labor theory of value, uh, let's do a little test. Make something, let's say an artwork, whatever, and spend a lot of labor doing it and see if you could sell it. Maybe it's a piece of junk. Make make a statue out of your own excrement uh, of yourself or something and, and, and see how much you could sell it for. And you're not going to be exploit exploited if no one buys it, if people think it literally is a piece of shit, and it literally is a piece of shit. No, it's not how much labor and how much effort you do something. And, you know, Mike is right. If it's the labor theory of value, prices are static and they never, ever change. Uh, well, I mean, they could base mate. I mean, you know, if you have new machines, that improves labor. So, you know, I guess it could not be static if something takes if something is worth less now because less labor was involved. But I mean, not every there are certain you know I, if if you believe I mean there are certain things that are worth the different things to different people. I mean, we know that there are a lot of people there, there uh, that um, you know. Um, it, it, if you sell them something uh, banana for two dollars, uh, it's worth it because they value banana at five. And other people will say I value banana fifty cents. And other people will say uh, you would have to pay me to take that banana. So people have different uh, different preferences. Um, and so yeah, not not every every not everything is the same. But I mean, Karl Marx's big mistake was he believed that when people trade, they trade things of equal value, and they don't. They trade because if they traded things of equal value, they wouldn't trade. It's right. right? Well, okay. so, well, that also comes from transaction costs because usually there's some transaction costs involved. You have to walk somewhere. There's scarcity in everything, even our time, right? So right. Even the very act of of having a a, a marginal zero right. trade is just like nobody would do it. You have to have some benefit uh, that's even higher than the transaction cost to actually be incentivized to make the trade. I completely agree with you. Which I think this brings us over to. Why the means of production should not be centralized and should not have some like just right. everybody come in here and decide what you want. Well, one one, one, arg one argument is that the reason the worker should own the means of production is because they work they work there, and and the analogy that I like to use is I own a block of Legos, I paid for the block of Legos, and I say to you. Please make me a, a nice figure out of these block of Legos, and I'll 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 give you a ten dollars an hour for your time. And you make the block of Legos, and I pay you ten dollars. Let's say it takes you two hours, and I pay you twenty dollars for your time to make something out of these block of Legos, and I sell it the Legos for a hundred bucks. Did I rip you off out of uh, eighty dollars? No. Did you pay for the Legos? No. Did you pay the electricity bill to work in the Lego factory? No. Did you pay uh, the cleaning staff to clean the Lego factory? No. You didn't pay for the tools. You didn't pay for the electricity. You didn't pay for the factory. So why do you own and more importantly, these means? Before, yeah, and more importantly, 
You didn't take any of the risk of this business. Most businesses don't even succeed within the uh, succeed within the first right. few years. Right. This is a huge undertaking. So for me to have any kind of reward down the end, it it took me a lot of risk, putting right. a lot of my capital and time and sweat and labor up that might have just been gone. You didn't right. do any I of mean, this. One, you were sitting reasons, at your house watching watching Breaking Bad while I'm out here working 80 hours a week trying to build this business. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons a lot of people want to work for other people is, I mean, right. I mean, a few reasons people want to work for other people. First of all, people have, have high time preferences. When I, when you work for me, you're getting paid now. You're getting paid before I sell the Legos to someone else. And there's no guarantee I'll even sell the Legos, right? I'm paying you, and let's say I can find no one to sell the Legos. Do you got to say to me, okay, I want... You, you, I can't go to you and say, give, give me the $20 that I paid you to build the Legos. I wasn't able to sell these Legos. No. So it's a risk that I'm able to sell these Legos for 100 bucks, and I'm taking that risk. And I'm getting the profit in the future. It might take a month. It might take a year until I can find someone to buy those Legos. But meanwhile, you're getting paid right away. So and money is always worth more now than it's in, in the future because the future is uncertain. And so you are getting paid for your reassur not in, not you know it's that joke. One of the benefits of being self-employed is that you can never go fi get fired, only bankrupt. You are get being paid to for, to not take the risk of being bankrupt and to get paid now instead of uh, the foreseeable future. And um and that and and that and that in itself. Uh, is is worth more because you don't have to stress, you don't have to worry. I mean, this whole nonsense. People talk about trickle down economics. You know, my father started a uh, a business, and it was about half a year uh, until he got profit, which is pretty good. I mean, Amazon was in business for ten years until they made profit. Do you think in those six months, my father didn't pay his workers, my father didn't pay the electricity bill, my father didn't pay uh, for uh, uh, the rent? Uh, of the building that he was working at, it's not trickle down. Quite the opposite. They, we get the, the 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 worker, the the owner gets it last. I pay you to build the Legos, bef first, and then I get paid to sell the Legos after. So it's not trickle down economics. There's no such thing. Well, as I, I, think, down I think economics. I think government is the failed, the real failed trickle down economics, right? Because they steal all the month and money and, and give it up to these few at the very top, and then it's supposed to trickle on down to the rest of us through government programs, right? That's the real fallacy of, of the trickle down. What you're saying is absolutely correct, Daniel, that the uh, the employer with all the risk and everything else that they're taking into this, especially in an open and free market where there's not, not much room for excess profits, unlike in the statism today where certain companies are given special advantages. In a free market, you would have much less room for excess profits. Once again, open competition uh, pulls down the amount of excess profits out there, right? So this is why today profits average around eight to ten percent. I think in a free society, they uh, they would probably average around four, three to four percent in my in my opinion. Yeah. But it'd even be lower because you're putting much more pressure on the rich. Of course, government doesn't want to do that to protect. Right. And also, the, I mean, one of one of the one of the big fallacies. I mean, you can you understand when people don't talk about economics when they talk about unemployment and and instead of production. Right? Employment is a means to an end. Okay? We can have full unemployment right now. Send every single person off to be a paid soldier. We'd starve to death. Okay? Well, Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin could make a bunch of jobs. He could say, go, go dig these ditches. Right. Seriously. Right. That's right. not if building wealth. That's we, not making right. you easier. Right. Life we, can, we, can get, uh, we can get unemployment down to zero uh, by, by having all these, uh, if government hired everyone, and we'd all die of starvation. Production of what people demand, not production of things that they don't want to value. Production of things that people demand is what grows the economy. It is in employment. The only reason you work is be so you could produce um, to begin with. So it's it's production that matters. It isn't uh, employment. Uh, it isn't, you know, we're creating more jobs and, and, and all these things. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and you're right. not creating more jobs because all the money that was taken from the fleece taxpayer to create jobs is not being used uh, in other ways, and um, and and you have to look at that loss as well. And and people always talk about you know we want to consume, consume, consume. Capitalism is all about consumption. No, capitalism is actually all about savings, right? A, an economy a grows through savings. If I'm on a deserted island and I and I and I just hunt fish. Uh, non-stop, um, I can hunt 
a certain fish by hand. But if I build a net, 10 fish instead of just one fish with each of my hands. But in order to build a net, I have to save resources to build a net. So it isn't, it isn't consumption which grows the economy at all. It's, it's savings. Which yeah, is savings. what which it's, is what the Austrians understand, which I don't think really much any other economist seems to really pay attention to. Not at all. Yeah, cap, capital accumulation and savings is what drives investment. It's not like the money just sits in Bill Gates' bed or in a vault. The, the the money goes back into the economy and spreads around and builds more jobs and stuff. So the whole idea that that you're just going to have some some uh, that capital and savings is like the wrong and bad. No, that's how people increase their standard of living. I wish we all had a lot more. You know, <laughs> that's the thing, right. and, and it, it really is the driving factor. Factor, to building up more factors of production and, and to increasing uh, our productive capabilities and capacities. So yeah. you're absolutely right. Um, Rothschild, listen, man, I got I got to go eat something, buddy. All right, <laughs> I got to go consume. All right, uh, I appreciate <laughs> you being on the show, man. All right, <laughs> I got to do labor. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm watching Breaking Bad. <laughs> That's hilarious. I actually haven't seen that show, but I heard it's good. I'll give it. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I, I heard it's pretty somewhat libertarian. Right, because it it's is. all about I think the consequences of le uh, drug legalization, right? I I don't, I don't I'm not too big into it, but I have seen a couple of the episodes early on, right. and, they, and it was pretty dramatic and stuff like that. But I'm not I, I'm I'm kind of a geek. I don't like just watching science fiction. I like to re learn the real world around me and see how I can help others instead of just wasting my life and others. So, you know what I'm saying, buddy? Yeah, you're right, trying man, to say hey. you're a better person than me. Not at all. I'm trying to say I like I to spend my kidding. time and putting the world around me. I know, buddy. <laughs> all right, man. I will talk to you soon. I, I thank you so much, uh, Rothschild, for being on all the right. show. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Guys, okay. thank you for checking out Triple V. As you guys know, I have videos coming out every single day. Tonight, I have a video coming out. It's a parody on drinking with Bob on government. I think it's going to be pretty hilarious. I think you'll get a good kick out of it. It's only a 30-second video. Uh, I also have some narration videos. I'm going to be doing one on the origins of money through Menger and a bunch of other great stuff coming up. So make sure you check back over here on voluntaryvirtues.com as well as my website, voluntaryvirtues.com, where you can actually find my calendar uh, calendar there and see all the people I have scheduled coming up uh, in the future for future interviews and uh, to have great discussions just like these. Thank you, guys, once again, for checking out Triple B. I'm Mike Shanklin, and I will talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.